Hello, my name is Becca Studer and today I am so pleased to be able to talk to you about the amazing George Fish School and the legacy this establishment left on our beloved town, Fort Mill. I discovered this project in December of 2017, and ever since, I have been working tirelessly with the George Fish alumni, the Girl Scouts of America, and the Fort Mill History Museum to create this documentary and capture the experience of George Fish for all of those who haven't had the pleasure of hearing about its remarkable history and alumni. After the abolishment of slavery in America, Jim Crow laws and Black codes continue to be the basis of racial segregation in the United States. From employment, transportation, education, and other common services, Blacks were marginalized and oppressed throughout the entire country. Those effects were felt throughout our whole community, here in Fort Mill by way of segregation of races at schools and the limited uses of facilities by some of the Black families who helped build the foundation of this community. While researching this topic, I had the opportunity to speak with some of the alumni at the local George Fish School, which was established for the Black children of Fort Mill in 1925 and remained in use by the school district as a segregated facility until 1968. Dr. Booker Talia Farrow Washington was an American educator, author, orator, and advisor to several presidents of the United States. He was the founder and first president of Tuskegee University. Beginning in 1912, he formed a relationship with the philanthropist Julius Rosenwald. He petitioned and received approximately $30,000 in donations from the Rosenwald Rural School Building Program, known as the Rosenwald Fund, to help build well-lit facilities for six schools in the Tuskegee area. These schools were designed by students at Tuskegee and were known as the offshoots of Tuskegee. They became a model for more than 5,000 Rosenwald schools in 15 states in the American South. The George Fish School was built on this model. 5,357 schoolhouses for black children were constructed across the Deep South. The rest of the costs were covered by both the black and white communities of Fort Mill. The George Fish School was established and dedicated in 1925. Its name honors Mr. George Fish, the superintendent of plants one and two for the Springs Mills Industries. He was an advocate for building a quality school for Black children in the community. The alumni I interviewed are all products of a close-knit, loving community, all formed around the environment created by George Fish. Students at the George Fish School faced a ton of barriers, including a lack of resources provided by the district and the state. Many of the ed educational materials were hand-me-downs from Fort Mill High School. Some students vividly remember erasing pencil marks out of old books. Others recall the makeshift black and white band uniforms made by band moms before the George Fish School received old uniforms from Fort Mill High School. Thankfully, this didn't stop these remarkable students from pursuing greatness. The outstanding teachers at the George Fish School continually inspired the students to pursue excellence. In terms of athletics, George Fish School was not lacking. They had a spectacular range of sports teams, including baseball and basketball. Many of these sports, as well as other community functions, were held in the beautiful gymnasium that was often considered the heart of the community gathering. Students at the George Fish School were encouraged to develop their passion for the arts through participation in the Glee and Dramatics Clubs. They were also encouraged to give back to their community through organizations such as the 4-H Club, and they refined their creative and homemaking skills through industrial arts and home economics programs. I went to George Fish School. As a matter of fact, I started there in first grade, and I went through the entire 12 years there. We didn't have any preschool or uh, the um, pre-K or anything like that. It was first grade through 12th grade. And I remember we had to sit in the movie upstairs. The segregation here was just like it was in place else. There were certain things that we were expected to, rules we were expected to follow. And in the movie, we were upstairs while the um, other races were, race was downstairs. And let's see, we had our own school. We had, um, different fountains. We had colored on one and white on the other. And um, let's see, just, you know, things like that. We, I remember as a child, but I'm 77 years old now. And I graduated from George Fish in 1959. Uh, all of our books were used books. 
the first band uniforms that we had, they were passed down. George Fish colors were blue and gold. And someone said, well, well, Fort Mill, Fort Mill High colors were blue and, blue and gold. Well, that's why our colors were blue and gold, because when they passed the band uniforms down, it was blue and gold. When they passed the basketball uniforms down, it was blue and gold. And uh, uh, that's what we, uh, that's why our school colors were, were blue and gold. We it was an uh, experience that I, I enjoyed. We had a good school. We played with the uh, ball. We did cheerleading. We did um, oh, various, what, um, glee club appearances. For me, I didn't grow up in Fort Mill, South Carolina. I grew up in a town called Van Wick. And we traveled every morning 14 and a half miles over here. And to me, it was a great experience because we were a family. We got to know each other. And I really enjoyed school because it was new and it was interesting. And I really loved it because it was uh, the teachers really cared about us. And I understood that they were my parents away from home. And it was very interesting. And to get further that, I cried when I had to leave in 1965. <laughs> because of the relationship with all the students, because we were family, friends, and we grew up together. So it was a very good time. I didn't understand it, but we rode the bus, and that was a joy. Mm -hmm. There was one teacher, Miss Diggs, D-I-G-G-S. She was a she was a minister's wife, and she always listened to everything she said. <laughs> so I was very careful about what I said <laughs> because my mother would, would 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 get me if I said something wrong. But uh, she was just a wonderful person, and. Um, I went there yeah, for 12 years, and I just never forget her. I never forget her. Back to our school, we'll find back in that time in the 1950s and 60s, uh, the teachers were from, by and large, from out of town and then the teachers uh, lived in the community. Uh, they took up residence, renting uh, rooms and space. And so therefore, uh, we as children, uh, students of the school in the community, we had to be on our P's and Q's, on our best behavior, uh, not only for our, uh, uh, for, our, for our parents, but if the teachers would see you doing something uh, that you should not be doing, uh, you would be disciplined right there on the spot. Uh, it, was a, it was a fine time, an innocent time of growing up. My memory of the night games, it was almost like, um, I don't know, how, how can you describe it? It was almost like going to the fair. Yeah. It was a big deal because yeah. they had the lights out there. You know, you pop the lights on and the lights are bright. You got the night game and, you know, I don't know if there's no popcorn or nothing like that going around, but uh, it was just, yeah, like, come. it was just exciting, you know. And because there was like, nothing else to do, you know, but play, you probably know nothing about uh, shooting marbles and hopscotch and, and, and jack stones and all that stuff. That's old school right there, right? It wasn't none of the video stuff going on. But, but the night games were, were, were special because it was just an exciting thing to do. It was like an outing that the community could go to and uh, just enjoy that evening and that night. It was wonderful, I thought. And they would have a gospel groups that would come around and they would have things that George Fish, like the gospel groups and mm -hmm. it, it was just, it, it's missed. It'd be great if they would still have them doing that now. Yeah. yeah. So I really loved George Fish and um, 
George Fish was really kind of the embodiment of the community. So because all of the grades were housed in one school, you know, essentially you had, um, you know, all the kids, you know, you know, there during the day. And because my family, you know, really did encourage academic pursuit, we took school seriously. In fact, we went to school and we played school after school. <laughs> That's how much we enjoyed school. And while I did not realize it at the time, because, you know, in, you know, the questions that you're asking, you're presenting them to, you know, people who are older and, you know, we're going back to the time when we were, you know, younger than 18 years old. Um, because it was a segregated school and because it was staffed by people who were committed. For example, you, you have heard that people traveled from other communities. I mean, there was a real passion and commitment, almost like missionaries. So people came with a, a fierce interest in educating um, students, and we felt that. Mm -hmm. And so the, the school was a place that encouraged um, um, achievement, you know, academic achievement, um, athletic achievement, and just in thinking about what it was like, um, so because I started school in 1964, and I went to George Fish for my first three years of school. I didn't do kindergarten, so I did first, second, and third grade. And um, my first teacher was Miss Castle, you know, which I think just about everyone was, you know, educated by Miss Castle, and she made. Um, a really big impact on me. Um, I was telling you about my handwriting earlier, and my handwriting used to be perfect, so I was also clearly like the teacher's pet. So she would let me, um, like if something needed, a poster needed to be made, she would let me write it out because I could do letters like the letters that used to be above the, the blackboard, mm -hmm. you know, which is, you know, a relic. But the point is that they were nurturing, and so you know, I felt cared for, and I felt that they really cared about our education. Um, another teacher was uh, Ms. Barnett, and then there was a Ms. Peterson. Those are my teachers. I helped the children by instrument, by, I would buy instrument and repair, and I would sell some instruments to the children, see. That couldn't afford instrument. See, they would be used instrument, but they're in good shape. See, I could repair instrument for all of them, you know, and they could stay in the band. And we did that, so we had a nice sad, size band, you know, starting band. And we were able to have concerts. And, certain things for the school. And we played in parades and had concerts, see. Uh, we, oh, we did so many things. Title IV of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 required that public schools cease segregation and make school assignments independently of factors such as race, national origin, color, or religion. Four years later, in 1968, George Fish became Fort Mill Junior High, a school for early teenagers of all races. Former George Fish students had mixed feelings about moving schools. They were thrilled to have new experiences and meet new people, but were obviously nervous to be in a new, unfamiliar environment. Luckily, George Fish school children were welcomed by the white schools, but they still felt different. They tried to emulate the behaviors of the students that they called city school kids. On the other hand, some students were too young to remember feeling any different or pay any attention at all. It was just different. Um... The teachers were different. They were a lot different than the teachers that we had at our school. It's just some, yeah, just had some getting used to. You had to get used to it. But we made it. Once we got used to it, we got friends and things like that. So, but yeah, it was just different. Um, uh, I remember the saying, you know, and I said, uh, we, we were already prepared in Lexington. 
you have to run faster, you have to jump higher than, uh, than the people at the other schools. And so, uh, I, and I found out what the meaning of that was. Uh, I, look at, I look at Fort Mill High that we weren't allowed to go to. The students that came out of there, some came out, they were engineers, they were, they were doctors, they were lawyers, they were teachers, professors, they, 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 were, they were successful in life. And then I look at George Fish. We had teachers to come out of there. We had doctors to come out of there. We had uh, college professors to come out of there. We had uh, uh, great uh, basketball players. We had, we had a lot of talent to come out of there. And uh, I measure that race, how, how the achievement was made, not from where they all made it to the top, but, uh, but the ones that started at George Fish, they started a little lower. And they had, when they run fast, they had to catch up with the others. And they, and they made it to the top, same as the others. And, and so, and, and we, were, we were proud of our school. Well, I stayed down to Fort Neal. I stayed down to George Fish until you had said earlier about the segregation, what with the integration. Mm -hmm. I stayed down there until the very last, I stayed down there until they changed the name from George Fish to Fort Mill Junior High. So I got some real good memories and I thought everything, that the, the way they, the discipline would make you the person that you are now because it was really good. When I was in third grade, and there probably was some talk about this maybe in second grade, but definitely by the time I was in third grade, it was clear that the schools were going to be desegregated. Uh, so there was going to be integration. And so in anticipation of that, we started to just anticipate what it was going to be like to study with um, the white kids. And I think that there was a sense of a competitiveness. And so, but I think that it not, wasn't simply competitiveness. There was a notion that we were going to go and let them know that we appreciated schooling as much as they did. And so there was a sense of making sure that we were prepared for that transition. Um, let me just back up before I talk about the transition. Um, you were asking what it was like growing up in Fort Mill, and so because the school system was segregated, there was also a separate swimming pool. And we did not realize, again, because we were kids, I remember when the swimming pool was put into, in the neighborhood, we just went and played and enjoyed it. We didn't think about whether or not there were other kids there, white kids, and my uncles, Three of them were lifeguards, so it's just another place where we feel really safe, you know, learning how to swim. So um, we weren't really thinking about the notion of segregation. That, that was just like a concept that was above our heads. But in school, that's when we started to realize, like, oh, there's a major change that's coming. And so um, we also didn't realize that the first year when the schools when we were able, to, so during my year, when we were able to leave and go to Carruthers, that was 1967, and I didn't realize this until later, but I remember being in, at Carruthers in fourth grade and wondering why there were, why I was only one of two black students. My sister was the only um, black student in her class, African American, and we were, like, with, even just within the last 10 years, we have been, um, talking about that and we were wondering you know where our friends were well in doing the research for the historic marker we found out that the first year was considered the freedom of choice year and this is a way that um, integration was transitioned in or introduced to the community so the first year people had the option of going to the formerly all-white school and our family chose to have us go and it was not until the next year, 1968, that we were federally mandated um, to um, integrate the schools. And the first year, in that freedom of choice year, only about 14, little over 14% of the students chose to go. And um, 
and of course the next year everyone was required to go. Uh, you know, I, I knew a lot of the black kids and had a lot of existing friendships, and I was an athlete, so being an athlete, that kind of made the transition a lot easier. Uh, as far as any surprises, not, not really, because many of the teachers came over, you know, from the white school system, and many of the, uh, uh, the, the black teachers that were there were great teachers. So there was no, in my opinion, no, no drop off or fall off in the quality of the education. Uh, as I said before, the Fort Mill school system has always been superlative, and it remains so. Um, I think there was a lot of uh, conversation about friction and apprehension. Uh, I think there was a, a small amount of that. But kids adapt so well. I think once we got into the swing of things and, you know, the, the sports helped, uh, that we all got under the banner of Fort Mill Junior High, and it, it, it made for a pretty smooth transition, in my opinion. Without a doubt, the black community here in Fort Mill was incredibly proud of the memories, successes, and culture structured around the George Fish School. Unfortunately, the building fell out of use and was demolished in the mid-1980s. Many of the children who had grown up in the George Fish community had graduated and dispersed at the time of the building's demolition. Some alumni didn't even know about the demolition until decades later. Upon finding out, many of the alumni were distraught and heartbroken. They felt as if their childhoods had, and memories had been ripped away from them. When finding out that the records, such as old pictures, yearbooks, and files from the school storage had been thrown away as well, they were determined to preserve the memory of the institution that they had grown up in. All of these records, once the school did close, uh, they were uh, boxed up and then taken to the Fort Mill School District and kept uh, there. Uh, I don't know whether they were just in boxes on the floor or whatever, but I was uh, at this time in New York and I, re I received a package in the mail from my, my brother of pictures of our family, of all of the yearbook pictures. And then there were other artifacts and uh, so I, asked, I said, where was this found? One, uh, a, a member of the community, uh, a, a former student, uh, was walking one morning by a Dipsy dumpster and found all of these pictures scattered. Uh, other boxes had been thrown in the Dipsy dumpster. And he saw that these pictures are uh, people here in the community, my classmates. He picked them up, he carried those and distributed them out to as many families as possible. And uh, it was still, we do not know how this happened. I don't know, uh, it, to sum it up, I would think that uh, with the school being torn down, um, the powers to be probably looked at it and then say that uh, uh, the history is not really needed anymore. And then someone took it up on their own to dump it. Uh, and I do not know who, and I, that is a violation, uh, but it's something that haunts me still today. 1959, and I really didn't have a real connection with that school after I left. Because I left, went to school myself, um, finished my formal education, went to work in North Carolina. So I didn't have a real connection with the school after 1959. I would visit the, the school for special occasions, such as reunions, uh, those kinds of things, for the marker, uh, installation, ceremony. But as far as my connection to the school, uh, after I left, I didn't have a real connection to that, to that building, to that school, to those particular records. But what I would like to, to, to say in, in regard to that, that's not atypical uh, in relationship to all of those schools that were torn down. There's a, a, a systematic uh, effort to destroy those records by certain by people who believe once the school is torn down, then the, the, the records should not exist because the school doesn't exist. 
Oh, I was disappointed, but I had already left Fort Mill. I had gone, moved to Texas. I was in my 20s when the school was torn down and had moved away uh, to D.C. and Maryland and then Texas. Uh, so I was, you know, hurt, kind of hurt about it, uh, but I didn't know all of the details until later on, you know, later on. But, uh, yeah, I was wondering why the school was torn down and why wasn't it kept. You know, there's a lot of questions with uh, no real answers at the time. And uh, I didn't realize the records hadn't been kept until someone found them and was distributing them to different family members. Uh, but, of course, thought that the records should have been kept, should have been school, uh, state property. Uh, so, you know, I was not pleased about that. As far as when you have anything that's as, as historical as that, being a, a, a mainstay in this community for so long, it's always sad when you see something destroyed like that. The, um, because you think of all the memories, all the folks that meant a lot to them. I mean, when, you're, when you've got some brick and mortar there, it's more than just that. Mm -hmm. It's memories and stuff. And being a historian, I was, I was really upset when you find out that records are just destroyed. I was torn apart about that. And just to think there was, it was a big school and um, I had so many memories. How did you feel when you found out that um, the original George Fish building had been torn down and how do you feel about the records not being preserved? So, when I found out about the school being torn down, I think that I might have been in residency. And so you can imagine that, or actually I might have been in medical school, because the school closed in 86, so you know, it was a very busy period of my time. But because my family always maintained a connection to Fort Mill, you know, for example, my mother would get the Fort Mill Times always, and so we always knew what was happening. And there's a major drumbeat <laughs> between the South and, you know, my family in New York and D.C. And so I was disappointed, and I also wonder, you know, what was happening in the town that the, the community had not been able to um, rally to keep it. But I wasn't surprised because I also think about people who had migrated, you know, part of that migration. A lot of resources, you know, people that were resourceful left, and um, I think it reflects this, the community not being organized enough. I'm talking about the African American community not being organized enough, and um, to um, you know mount an effort to you know even keep it as a community center. So what was most disappointing was the way that it was handled in terms of the records not being kept and um, learning, and I remember seeing the photographs of family members, you know, the, the little school pictures, you know, just knowing that they were discarded. I felt that that was residue of a sentiment, you know, a sentiment about um, the segregated black school. So that was disappointing. When they closed the school, uh, they, uh, they decided they had to sell it. And I, my father had been uh, chairman of the school board when they built the gymnasium, and so he was always proud of it because it was the best in the state. And I, uh, I kind of fell in love with it myself, and so I, I, I made an offer to buy it because I had the idea of keeping that the school is uh, is a uh, community type center for the general paradise area, and uh, I. I I, I bought this. I bought it because I had that vision, and I did not fulfill that vision. Because, but the but the but the uh, the com community center would have been based around the gymnasium, because it was one of the best in the state, right. and had uh, it really was. And and I played I played a lot of basketball down there, but we did it some most of the time on weekends like Saturday or Sunday, you know, when they opened the schools, you could do that then. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and it was going to cost so much mm -hmm. to make it a community and I didn't get, I couldn't get uh, town approval to, to take it over, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, would, it had to have been sort of a, a, a community effort. And so Duke Power, they are there today, they came in and and uh, I remember they came in my law office, the, the uh, man that was, 
he was second to the president and in, in legal counsel, and I had known him for a good while. And he, he, he came in with his salespeople, and they offered me a bunch of money. And this a small town boy saw, saw an opportunity to make some money off of purchasing it, and that's exactly what I did. I, I certainly regretted it after, later, but uh, at that time it was, I had a couple of kids in school and that kind of stuff. So. The alumni knew that the memory of George Fish was vital to the history of Fort Mill. They came together to create the George Fish Historical Monument, located on Steel Street where the George Fish School once stood. In 2020, the site was recognized as a historical site and commemorated with an official South Carolina historical marker. Despite its demolition, the memory of George Fish lives on today in each and every teacher, alumni, and family that contributed to its success. And even now, the alumni continue to assert that their education and George Fish encourage them to pursue greatness in everything that they do. And this has been evident in all of their lives and careers. Several people, several teachers, um, really impacted um, my wanting to continue school. Uh, early on, as a teacher, Mrs. Brown, and I always tell this story uh, because I was very, very small. In fact, when I graduated from high school, I, I didn't weigh 120 pounds. Real short and, and timid, and, and didn't have a real uh, strong um, opinion of myself as a human being. And she said to me, she said, Calvin, you know, you really are smart. And I knew she was not telling me the truth. And she said that, but she told me that. And just her telling me that uh, caused me to spend more time and more effort towards school. Uh, Ms. Brown, early on. Uh, Ms. Little John, my teachers. So it's several teachers in the school really um, supported our educational development. So I finished college at Wheaton College in Massachusetts and then I graduated from, from Georgetown School of Medicine. And I did a residency in psychiatry at George Washington University and I did analytic training and I'm a board certified psychiatrist. I'm also a practicing psychoanalyst. I have a private practice in Washington DC for psychiatry and psychoanalysis. And I think, of, I think about the foundation of my education as being my experience at George Fish. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that it gave me something that, you know, helped me to understand my worth um, in a very safe place. But the education, I, I, I'm sure it set me up to, to be where I'm at now in that I did learn something, if you will. But I didn't go to college, but I went into the military and I did get education through the military, if you will. But it did set, set the grounds for me, I guess, getting a higher education through the military and being where I'm at now. And, and graduated from University of Maryland, uh, a bachelor's and master's in information technology. Uh, and went to work in various technology companies, testing software, uh, MCI, Bell Atlantic at the time, which is now Verizon, uh, the Pentagon, Federal Credit Union, uh, and some other companies. A Marriott, I worked as an executive secretary for two general managers at the Dulles Airport Marriott. Yeah, so, and now I'm at York Tech College. So, when I left Fort Mill, I went to A&T State University, and that's where I had my two-year course in, um, I forgot the title they call that two-year course, but anyway, it was business, like, and I enjoyed that life. Right back. Then I began teaching in the school system in Greensboro City, North Carolina, Greensboro, North Carolina, the city school system. I stayed there until, well, that's the second master's. I went, I took a leave of absence and went to A&T State University for second master's in 1987 on leave from the Greensboro City Schools. And then I returned to the Greensboro City Schools with a second master's and I wanted out of the classroom. So I couldn't get out of the classroom in that particular system so I left the system in 1990, went to New Jersey 
and became an administrator in the New Jersey school system in Camden, New Jersey, and stayed there in that system for about 10 years and then became principal of an elementary school in right outside of Atlantic City, Pleasantville, New Jersey. And I retired in 2001. Thank you for coming on this extraordinary historical journey and for taking the time to delve into the rich history behind the George Fish School and the Black community of Fort Mill. I am so blessed to have been submerged in this amazing community. Because of them, my eyes have been opened not to not only the injustice and racism in our history, but how the marginalized found opportunities to better themselves beyond what society expected them. Before we close, the George Fish family would like to share some words of advice for students today. These extraordinary men and women have stunning insight that has propelled them to become the world changers that they are today. Thank you again. Please enjoy these final statements. My advice is to stay in school regardless. Study hard and be exposed to your surrounding. You look at the long view because you don't, you, you, you look ahead. Don't always look at the right now. You know, and I think kids need to understand that because they're not going to be, you're not going to be young forever. I would tell them to treasure the memories that they have of their time in school because that's just only a fraction of your life. Yeah. Well, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge is power. Yeah. And uh, I guess I, I would say apply, apply yourself, mm -hmm. get the knowledge that's needed. Try to go forward and make a difference. Oh, I would tell them to learn as much as you can. Take time to know where you are right now. Just stop because I know a lot of times it seems like everybody's going, you know, 100 miles an hour. Just, just take the time to realize where you are right now and appreciate it. Just be a dreamer. Dream what you want, what you want to do and go for it. And just remember to be fair, be firm, consistent, and honest. That's how I tried to be with the students I had over the 32 years that I taught school. Try to see others as they are and to try to be critical thinkers and try to understand someone um, as opposed to judging them and adopting the party line of the family. Uh, don't waste your time. Don't waste other people's time. People that are trying to pour into you and help you and guide you, you know, don't waste their time uh, and respect your elders and uh, other people around you, you know. I would advise or admonish anybody who's of that age going through that experience. While you're there, slow down, enjoy it, relish it, savor it, because those are going to be some of the times of your life. Because uh, keep, keep down those student loans if you can, you know. Try to love everybody. You can be successful in life. I would tell them to pursue your education in some form or fashion. Um, uh, education is something that does not stop at high school. It does not stop at college. Uh, it continues in life. Uh, you are a lifelong student. And do not let anyone say you cannot do something. If you put your mind to it, you can reach the stars.